The 9,080th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is maintenance of peace and security of Ukraine. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Estonia, Poland and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Rosemary Di Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the Agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Rosemary Di Carlo. <clears throat> Mr. President, when I last briefed this Council on 5 April, it hardly seemed possible that the devastation being wrought on Ukraine and its people could get any worse. In the 10 weeks since, countless more Ukrainian civilians have been killed in indiscriminate attacks. Cities and towns continue to be leveled, and much of the country's arable land has been horribly disfigured by shelling. And this horrific conflict an open source of instability in Europe shows no signs of abating. The depravity of the war was once again on full display yesterday following the missile strike in Kremenchuk in central Poltova region. Hundreds of people, perhaps even some trying to get a respite from the daily horrors of war, suffered one of the most shocking attacks of the conflict when a shopping center was hit by what are reported to be Russian missiles. 18 civilians were reportedly killed and 59 injured. The final toll may be much higher. This incident, which should be investigated, was the latest in a new wave of airstrikes and missile attacks in Kiev, Chernihiv, Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, and other cities far from the front lines, with many civilians killed or injured. Presently, the most intense fighting is in and around the towns of Severodonetsk, Lysinchansk, Slavyansk, and Slavyansk in the Donbass. Heavy fighting is also reported around the cities of Kharkiv and Kherson. In scenes reminiscent of world wars, large-scale artillery duels are devastating industrial areas, with thousands of civilians forced to hide in basements or flee for their lives. Large military casualties are claimed on both sides. Mr. President, civilians continue to pay too high a price in this war. As of 26 June, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights recorded 10,631 civilian casualties in the country, 4,731 killed and 5,900 injured. These are figures based on verified incidents. The actual figures are considerably higher. Most of the civilian casualties recorded were caused by explosive weapons with a wide impact area. Many of these weapons are inherently indiscriminate when used in populated areas and therefore result in increased civilian casualties and devastating humanitarian impacts. The Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine concluded earlier this month its first mission to the country, including visits to Bucha, Irpin, Kharkiv, and Sumy. Though only in the initial stages of its work, the Commission received information and visited cities that, quote, may support claims that serious violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law, perhaps reaching war crimes and crimes against humanity, have been committed, end quote. The work of the Commission of Inquiry, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, and other fact-finding efforts are essential for establishing accountability for the crimes and atrocities committed during this war. This work must lead to justice. 
It is imperative for the people of Ukraine. It is also crucial if we hope to be able to prevent such violations in the future, wherever they threaten to occur. Mr. President, since 24 February, over 8.8 .8 million people across Ukraine have received some form of humanitarian assistance and protection services. At least 16 million people need such aid. Needs are increasing, especially ahead of winter. Humanitarian partners are working on a winterization assistance plan and revising the flash appeal, which runs through August, to cover the needs through the end of 2022. Women, in particular, are facing immense hardship when it comes to health, safety, and access to food. A rapid gender analysis by UN Women and Care in April revealed that women are increasingly becoming heads of household and leaders in their communities as men are conscripted. They must be included in formal decision-making processes related to humanitarian efforts, peacemaking, and other areas that directly impact their lives. Perilous conditions are hampering efforts by humanitarian partners to reach civilians or for them to access the support they need. One statistic sheds light on this concern. Since 24 February, the World Health Organization has recorded 323 attacks on healthcare facilities and personnel, resulting in 76 deaths. We strongly remind all parties of their obligations under international humanitarian law. All adequate measures must be taken to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. Mr. President, Ukraine is suffering the largest human displacement crisis in the world today. Since the start of the Russian invasion, more than one quarter of the country's population, 12 million people, have been forced from their homes. Within Ukraine, over 7.1 million people remain displaced by the war. UNHCR estimates there are over 5.2 million refugees present across Europe. Over 3.5 million refugees from Ukraine have registered for temporary protection or similar national protection schemes in Europe. The UN remains committed to provide support for the government-led responses in host countries. Also, Given the increasing protracted nature of the conflict, we must not neglect Ukraine's long-term recovery and rebuilding needs. Using early socioeconomic assessments, UNDP launched a new resilience and recovery program to support the Ukrainian government's emergency response, its commitment to public services, and to keeping the economy running, as well as to help assess priority needs to deliver for the people of Ukraine. Mr. President, the war is having devastating consequences not only on the country and the immediate region, but far beyond Ukraine's borders. As the Secretary General noted on 8-9 during the launch of the second brief of the UN Global Crisis Response Group on food, energy, and finance, the war is exacerbating the greatest cost of living crisis in a generation. Price shocks in the global food, energy, and fertilizer Fertilizer markets are escalating. In a world already grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. To address this multidimensional threat, strong political will across the multilateral community and a comprehensive approach is foremost necessary. Mr. President, we've run out of words to describe the senselessness, futility, and cruelty of this war. As the Secretary General warned, for those on the ground, every day bling, brings new bloodshed and suffering. And for people around the world, the war, together with other crises, is threatening to unleash an unprecedented wave of hunger and destitution, leaving social and economic chaos in its wake. No country or community will be left untouched. The cycle of death, destruction, dislocation and disruption must stop for the sake of Ukraine, Russia, and the entire world. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Ms. Di Carlo for her briefing. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine.
Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, the Albanian presidency in the UN Security Council for promptly convening this meeting at Ukraine's request and for the opportunity to address you. Unfortunately, as of now, the United Nations uh, does not have a legal definition of the term terrorist state agreed by all UN members. But this war that Russia is waging against Ukraine demonstrates not only the meaning of this concept, but also the urgent necessity to enshrine it legally at the level of the United Nations and punish any terrorist state. Take a look at just recent events uh, of a few recent days in Ukraine, a few from the 125 days of Russia's full-scale war of conquest against Ukraine. Saturday, 25th of June, 62 Russian missiles hit our cities. Sunday, 26th of June, and more, ten, more rockets. One of them hit a residential building in the capital city of Kyiv. Three stories of a simple building were demolished. Another rocket is exploded in the yard of an ordinary kindergarten. Monday, 27th of June, a missile strike in Kremenchuk. Those who carried out this strike could not have been unaware of directing a missile on a simple trade center, one of many shopping malls to be found everywhere in the world. As of now, 18 people are reported to have been killed, but unfortunately there may be more. Uh, another 50 people are wounded and dozens are missing. Seven fragments of bodies have been found ripped off limbs, hands and feet of the people. And if the Russian state claims that all these victims suffered not from its missile strike, then I suggest the United Nations send either a special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations or a plenipotentiary commission to decide of this terrorist act at Kremenchuk so that the UN could independently find out all the information and see that this indeed was a Russian missile strike. Yesterday, Russian army also used uh, rocket artillery against a queue of people lined up for water that took place in the city of Lysychansk, Lugansk region. Ordinary, peaceful people, none of them served in the military, just a queue of people for water. Eight people were killed, including a 15-year-old boy named Danilo. The eldest of the victims was 68 years old, and I want you to hear the, the names of four women killed in the strike, Victoria, Irina, Olena and Lyudmila. Almost on a daily basis, cruel Russian strikes are targeted against Kharkiv. Just yesterday, nine were killed, 29 wounded, five of whom are children. I want you to know their names. Uh, Oleg, 8 years old, uh, Mikhailo, 11 years old, Grigori, ten year, 9 years old, Artem, 10 years old, Gleb, 12 years old. It was a Russian artillery strike against ordinary residential buildings. Today, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the Russian army uh, struck Mikolaev and the town of Ochakiv in the Mikolaev region. In Ochakiv, three people were killed, a girl, 6 years old, whose name was Eve a man named Magomed, who was 76, a woman by the name of Galena, who was 50. Among the wounded is a child, a boy, three months of age. He was born after Russian full-scale uh, invasion started. His name is Volodymyr, and he is severely injured. He is in intensive care. I stress once again, a child, a three-month-old child.
two more missiles today hit the city of Slonwa, Slovyansk in Donbass. The long-suffering Donbass, tormented Donbass that Russia has humiliated since 2014, just a few hours before this address of mine to you, to the UN Security Council, two missiles hit Odessa region. The, uh, the city of Dnipro was also targeted, and one of the missiles destroyed a car service station, not a military station, but a usual car service. And I have a question to you, ladies and gentlemen. Who of you does not agree that this is terrorism? If in any other part of the world, any organization acted just like Russia, who is killing Ukrainians, if a country killed any peaceful people, that would definitely be recognized as terrorism. Such an organization would become an enemy for all of humankind. Therefore, what is punished at the level of concrete criminals and criminal organizations must not go unchecked at the level of the state, which has become a terrorist. Daily terrorist acts, without weekends, every day, they are working as terrorists. The UN Charter confers on the UN Security Council the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Article 6 of Chapter 2 of the UN Charter clearly states that a member of the UN, which has persistently violated the principles contained in the present Charter, may be expelled from the organization by the General Assembly of the Security Council. Although Russia is violating fundamental principles of the UN and the international legal order, it is still not held to account at the global level. It still remains in UN agencies and even enjoys the privileges of the seat it occupies, the seat of the permanent member of the UN Security Council, which Russia occupies solely due to the short-sightedness of politicians at the end of the Cold War. Russia does not have the right to take part in discussing and voting in regard to the war in Ukraine, which is unprovoked and simply colonialist of the part of Russia. I urge you to deprive the delegation of the terrorist state of its powers in the UN uh, General Assembly. That is possible, that is necessary, that is fair. Russia does not have the right to remain in the UNSC, and that path is not too arduous, as some may believe. If we exercise some consistent, consistency and appropriate political will, that is the only logical way for the UN Charter to work and be respected by all members of the organization. Furthermore, our organization now has sufficient strength to hold to account uh, the terrorist state. Chapter 7 of the UN Charter allows establishing a special uh, international tribunal for investigating the actions of Russian occupiers on Ukrainian soil. The word genocide has repeatedly been used, and all of you have seen what Russian occupiers have done in our city of Bucha. Each of you can obtain information on how many mass graves appeared around the single city of Mariupol after the Russian army raised it to the ground. It was a city of 500,000 residents, and now it lies in ruins. In the case of genocide in Rwanda, the UN Security Council established an international tribunal during six months since the beginning of the genocide. Since the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, more than four months have passed since the beginning of Russia's war against Ukraine in Donbass and the occupation of Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, which has been repeatedly condemned at the level of the UN General Assembly, more than eight years have passed. We need to act urgently to, to do everything to make Russia stop the killing spree, uh, the killings of children, people, everyone. We need to hold it account for the terrorism. Otherwise, it will 
terror, terrorist activity in other countries of Europe and Asia, Baltic states, Poland, Moldova, Kazakhstan, many nations have already heard threats from Russian officials and state propagandists. I am grateful to all the diligent and civilized states who share our position and help defend the international legal order. This meeting of the uh, UN Security Council convened is convened after the Russian missile strike in Kremenchuk. But in fact, the meeting of the UN Security Council uh, may not be adjourned at all. It can go on round the clock, day after day, for us to have time to discuss every terrorist act of the Russian state. The UN Charter gives all the levers to influence any violator of the rules of the organization, any aggressor, any terrorist state. And I urge you to take advantage of these levers. It is imperative to deprive the Russian delegation of the opportunity to manipulate the UN. It is imperative to make it impossible for Russia to stay in the UN Security Council until its terrorism continues. It is imperative to establish a tribunal for investigating everything that the Russian military have done against Ukrainians, and it is imperative to uh, give the legal definition of the notion state terrorism at the UN level, all Russian action must receive legal assessment and global sanctions for the fact that Russia is destructing international legal order. Thank you for your attention. I wish to say just one more thing. Various countries worldwide can have uh, different uh, attitudes to wars uh, worldwide, but they similarly commemorate the victims, not only the military, but uh, every person, every child who is dying, unfortunately, due to this tragedy, the tragedy of war. That is the usual thing. Usually treat with respect and sympathy those who have been unfairly killed. And only the killers do not commemorate those whom they have killed. And I ask you now, I will be very much grateful if you could commemorate all the Ukrainians who have been killed in this war, all the adults, all, the, all of our children, tens of thousands of people, and I ask you to commemorate them with a, mo with a minute of silence. Thank you very much indeed. It is a great honor for us. Thank you for support. Thank you very much indeed. I thank His Excellency Mr. Zelensky for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of Albania. Thank you, USG Di Carlo, for this update. Again, a troubling one on this issue. Colleagues, a senseless war of aggression that could and must have been avoided has entered its fifth month. 125 days of outspread destruction, mounting civilian casualties and continued pain inflicted on millions of people across Ukraine. Other millions across the world find themselves victims as collateral damage of a war that has nothing to do with them, that is weaponizing everything, energy, trade, communication, including primarily food. Colleagues, let's remind ourselves, on 29th March, five weeks after the start of its war of choice in Ukraine, Russia announced its withdrawal of forces from the Kyiv area. 
The reason provided then was that it was a goodwill gesture to favor negotiations between the parties. The truth proved very different. The attempt to take in Kiev failed spectacularly. Negotiations went nowhere. War intensified instead. Russia continues its massive assault on Ukraine, threatening Europe, running against every human effort invested since World War II to build global peace through the international rule of law. As war has shifted ferociously to the east, life returned to some sort of normalcy in Kiev until missiles starting again falling from the sky with an unmistaken message. Russia can hit you at will, anywhere, anytime, just because it can. Last Sunday, nearly 1,000 people found themselves under a Russian airstrike which hit a shopping mall in the city of Kremenchuk in central Ukraine. Reportedly, tens of people lost their lives and several dozens were injured. What possible justification can be provided to missiles thrown over a commercial center in the very heart of an urban area? What can possibly explain such blatant indiscriminate brutality against civilians. We have heard so many times, Russia has continued to deny struggling civilians, but overwhelming evidence like this one proves again and again the contrary. Have we forgotten that Kiev was deliberately targeted last April as the UN Secretary General was visiting the city? Reports speak now of deliberate attacks in protesting to the G7 meeting. If it were so, why should civilians, including children, pay the price of such despicable symbolism? Indiscriminate attacks on civilian infrastructure and innocent civilian constitute war crimes. We all know it. Those who decide to attack shopping centers, shelters, schools, hospitals, kindergarten, apartment buildings are well aware of possible civilian casualties. They know they are committing war crimes when their responsibility is to protect civilians. They must pay for these actions. Colleagues, this aggression is not limited to Ukraine only. Zealous commentators of the state propaganda, but also senior Kremlin officials fill the air with worst case scenario of deploying weapons of mass destruction, including, as we have heard more than once, nuclear cyber rattling. We notice a dramatic increase of cyber warfare and advanced disinformation attacks. Further, the current food insecurity crisis continues to spread around the world. Global food prices are now at an all-time high. This is the parallel war that Russia is waging against the world. It has transformed the war in Ukraine from a local act of aggression to an acute international challenge. We know that millions of tons of grain are piled in Ukraine. Out of it, 8 million tons are said to be in the occupied areas of Russia, and Russia is reportedly stealing it from Ukraine. A meticulous and professional investigation from the BBC shows how this is carried out in Donbas, and not only for the grain, but also for other Ukrainian assets. Russia has already occupied 20% of the Ukrainian territory, but its appetite has increased. Colleagues, this war is paralyzing Ukraine. It is destroying its industry, its roads and schools and its health system along the way. It is killing civilians. It is punishing its youth and it's destroying the fabric of a society. But also it is testing the resolve of all those who truly believe in the rules international order, in rules-based international order in the respect of the UN Charter. Therefore, this is no time to stay aside. International support for Ukraine and its people is a moral and solidarity issue. It is to choose to stand on the right side, that of the law, of rights, of life, of dignity. One day this war will be over, but the way it will end matters to all of us. If we want to preserve the rule of law, we must make sure that everyone knows the cost of aggression against another country. 
We welcome the recent commitments of G7 for a new package of coordinated actions aimed at increasing pressure on Russia over its war in Ukraine. We also welcome the latest decision of the European Union. Colleagues, let me end with this. This war must stop with full and immediate withdrawal of the Russian forces and military equipment from the, territory, from the entire territory of Ukraine. The sooner, the better for all, Ukraine, for Russia, and the entire world. Thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Under Secretary General DiCarlo, for your compelling, if ultimately heartbreaking, briefing. I thank President Zelensky for addressing the Council again today. We were honored by his presence here, but I think we're all horrified by the circumstances under which we meet. And we express our deepest condolences to him and the people of the Ukraine for the horrors they continue to suffer on a daily basis, including the senseless attack by Putin's forces that destroyed the shopping center in Kremenchuk. America stands, as always, united with Ukraine. It would already be an outrage if yesterday's attack was a horrific exception, but it is not even that. The attack fits into a cruel pattern, one where the Russian military kills civilians and destroys civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. The Kremlin has demonstrated time and time again that it is trying to subjugate Ukraine, its sovereignty, its people, its spirit. Putin keeps trying to intimidate and divide Ukraine's partners. We have shown and will continue to show that our support for Ukraine is resolute. I expect the representative from the Russian Federation in a moment to try to obfuscate, to avoid responsibility and blame others for this tragedy. But no one here will be fooled. We all see the grim reality for what it is. And the reality is that Russia's war of choice has led directly to the destruction of crowded malls, grocery stores, theaters, hospitals, and schools, and the innocent civilians inside them. Make no mistake, there is ample publicly available evidence that Russia, and Russia alone, is responsible for these attacks. And make no mistake, deliberate and indiscriminate attacks on civilians and civilian objects constitute war crimes. The United States has previously assessed that members of Russia's armed forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. I repeat, to be clear, war crimes. The evidence is mounting and it cannot be ignored. We have seen too many credible reports of the bombing of schools and hospitals, like the maternity hospital in Mariupol, the killing of aid workers, the targeting of a civilians attempting to flee for their lives, or standing in line for water, as the President just reminded us. We've seen forced relocation of thousands of Ukrainian civilians and the brutal execution-style murder of those going about their daily business in Bucha. We call upon all fellow council members, including those who are failing to condemn what is in front of them, to speak the full truth. We all have a responsibility to make clear the moral culpability that Russia holds in this war of choice. There's no such thing as both sides when it comes to these recent attacks. The international community must hold those who perpetrated and ordered these crimes to account. Justice must be served. Justice must come for Russia's military and political leadership, as well as for its military rank and file who commit war crimes or other atrocities. The United States supports all international investigations into these crimes, including those being conducted by the ICC, the UN, and the OSCE. We have welcomed the International Criminal Court's decision to open an investigation into atrocity crimes committed in Ukraine. And with our EU colleagues, we are supporting the Ukrainian national authorities, specifically the Office of the Prosecutor General, as these authorities investigate and prepare to prosecute war crimes cases. At the same time, the world 
has come together to say enough is enough. Just yesterday, leaders of G7 countries reaffirmed our solidarity and unwavering commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty. Our leaders made clear that we will help Ukraine defend itself and choose its own future free from external pressure or influence. And the United States and the world will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will not rest until Russia ends this cruel and senseless war. How many more attacks will there be before those on this council who continue to tap dance around Russia's culpability demonstrate that they care more about the protection of civilians than protecting their own interests and start speaking of the steps Russia needs to take to resolve the crisis that it started. Colleagues, Russia started this war. Russia is the one committing atrocities against civilians, and only Russia can end this war by withdrawing its forces from Ukraine and reaching a political settlement with Ukraine's democratically elected government. Let us all continue to do everything in our power to see that day soon. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of France. President, I should like to thank Ms. Di Carlo for her briefing. And I welcome the participation of President Zelensky and can assure him of France's full solidarity with Ukraine. France condemns categorically the Russian strike yesterday against a shopping center in the town of Kremenchuk which, according to provisional estimate, has claimed at least 10 victims. This unjustifiable attack is only the latest in a long string. In recent days, the Russian army has deliberately bombarded Ukrainian territory, targeting residential zones and civilian infrastructure. Far from combat zones. The cost has been high. In Kharkiv, in Lysychansk, and in the center of Kiev, Russian missiles have caused several deaths and dozens of injured. Since the beginning of this war, Russia has chosen to target populations, killing children, humanitarian personnel and journalists. Russia continues relentlessly to destroy civilian infrastructure. This is a tactic of war aimed at terrorizing and demoralizing the Ukrainian people. In doing this, Russia continues to violate the most elementary principles of international humanitarian law. After having trampled underfoot the Charter of the United Nations and its founding principles, as so clearly stated by the International Court of Justice on the 16th of March last. President, I say this with no hesitation. War criminals shall be brought to justice. France will continue to support the work of international, regional and national jurisdictions and mechanisms to ensure that the acts committed in Ukraine, some of which may constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity, do not go unpunished. France renews its call to cooperate with the International Criminal Court and with the investigation mechanisms. France will continue to exert maximum pressure to compel the Russian authorities to bring an end to this war. The whole world is affected by this conflict. It could cause a fifth of the world's population to slide into poverty and food insecurity. And Russia bears the full responsibility. It is unacceptable for Russia to use hunger as a political lever. I wish to recall this. The sanctions adopted against Russia, unlike what is being said, do not target cereals or agricultural goods or fertilizers. Russia must lift the blockade on Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea in order to allow the export of foodstuffs. France fully supports the efforts deployed by the Secretary General in this regard. President, France calls upon Russia to uphold its international commitments, to cease hostilities, to withdraw its armed forces from Ukraine, and to bring an end to this unjustifiable and devastating war. 
Humanitarian access must be guaranteed, particularly in those regions most affected by combat. In the face of the historic challenge posed by the return of war in Europe, the European Union has decided to grant Ukraine the status of, a of an accession candidate. Because today the people of Ukraine are fighting to defend our values and those promoted by the Charter of the United Nations. France has already mobilized $2 billion for economic and humanitarian assistance and will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Ukrainian people. And I take this opportunity here to salute once again their courage. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for his statement. Representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank the Albanian Presidency for convening this urgent Security Council, Security Council meeting on the conflict in Ukraine. And I thank Under Secretary Rosemary De Carlo for her briefing. Brazil received with deep concern recent news of air strikes on or near densely populated areas in Ukrainian cities, of which the commercial center of Kremenchuk yesterday is the most dramatic example. We deeply regret the loss of human life and the destruction of urban and industrial infrastructure, which will be undoubtedly have serious consequences for the already dire humanitarian situation in the country. Attacks against civilian objects, especially in densely populated areas, encourage a perverse logic of retaliation. We urge the parties to allow an impartial investigation into these incidents and to refrain from actions that could result in increased civilian casualties. Brazil reiterates its call for parties to respect their obligations under the UN Charter and international humanitarian law, including observing the principles of distinction and proportionality. This comprises the protection of civilians in all circumstances entailing the exercise of restraint by military forces and the establishment of mechanisms for evacuating areas directly impacted by operations. We encourage parties to engage in constructive dialogue to achieve this common goal. Mr. President, four months after the start of the conflict, it should be clear that there is no alternative to a political solution. It is unreasonable for military operations to be prolonged with no prospect for an end to the immense human suffering imposed on civilian populations. We renew our appeal for an, immedi for an Im immediate cessation of hostilities and the establishment of peace negotiations without delay or preconditions. This Council is responsible for creating conditions for dialogue. We should redouble efforts to seek solutions that favor peace negotiations and minimize the impacts of the conflict, both in Ukraine and in, and in other affected regions. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President and I join others in thanking USG De Carlo for her briefing. And while we welcome President Zelensky's participation, again, we deeply regret the circumstances that brought him here today. President, just over four months since the start of its illegal invasion, Russia's war against Ukraine continues. Russia continues to pummel Ukraine's eastern Donbass region in an effort to seize full control. And over the weekend, Russia launched an intense barrage of cruise missile attacks at targets across Ukraine, including hitting a shopping center in Kremenchuk with over 1,000 people inside. We heard from President Zelensky the roll call of the recent dead, 
and extend our condolences to their families and their friends. When the world calls for peace, for dialogue and adherence to international law, Russia answers with escalation, with missiles and targeting civilians. More attacks, more destruction, more death, and as I'm sure we will hear again today, more war propaganda, more lies, more disinformation. Nor can we ignore the prominent role of Belarus in the direct staging post for the attacks over the weekend and yesterday. We praise the extraordinary bravery and resolve of the Ukrainian people in the face of this brutal assault on its sovereignty and territorial integrity and its very existence as a country. Ukraine is entitled to defend itself as any of us would if our cities, towns and villages were subject to repeated relentless missile strikes by a foreign army focused on wiping out our existence. So we will continue to support Ukraine to exercise this right of self-defense and to re-secure its privileges and rights under the UN Charter. We yet again reiterate the calls of the international community for Russia to end its illegal invasion, withdraw outside Ukraine's internationally recognized borders and enter into dialogue and negotiation. At a time when we are facing the existential threats of climate change and food insecurity following a global pandemic, Russia must end its illegal war and its blockade of Ukraine's ports. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would like to thank the Under Secretary General for her briefing, a briefing which highlights yet again the brutality of this unlawful war. For four months, Mr. President, we have called for an end to the unjustified and unjustifiable war being waged against Ukraine. Yet, as each day passes, reports of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law by Russia grow. Civilians in Ukraine continue to pay the highest price. On Monday, Russian forces attacked a shopping mall in Kremenchuk, full of civilians going about their ordinary lives. This appears to have been a clear attack against civilians and civilian infrastructure in flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. The consequences of this attack, reported by credible media sources, is civilians killed. Mr. President, we have heard today how civilians continue to bear the brunt of Russia's unconscionable war. All allegations of violations of international human rights and humanitarian law must be investigated and those responsible held to account. Parties to conflict must comply with international humanitarian law, including the obligation to distinguish between civilians and combatants and to attack only military object objectives. The prohibitions against indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks and the obligation to take all feasible precautions in attack. Mr. President, compliance is not optional. Yesterday, yesterday's Russian strike on Kremenchuk is not the first on Ukraine's towns and cities, we know. We deplore Russia's use of explosive weapons, including prohibited cluster munitions in populated areas without regard for civilians. The UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine has recorded over 10,000 civilian casualties, 
most of which have been caused by the use of explosive weapons. We condemn indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks in all circumstances. We are committed to ensuring accountability for the atrocious crimes taking place in Ukraine and recognise the important role of the ongoing investigation of the International Criminal Court in helping to pursue this. We must not accept impunity for those inflicting such horrors, not in Ukraine, not anywhere in the world. We once again call on the Russian Federation to comply with its obligations under international law. There must be full, safe and unhindered humanitarian access for humanitarian personnel to reach civilians, including those who choose to remain in Ukraine and those who are un unable to depart, including the elderly. They are not combatants and must be protected in accordance with international humanitarian law. The Russian Federation must allow those seeking to leave their towns and cities in Ukraine to do so safely to destinations of their own choosing. President, Russia can end its aggression if it chooses, but even while it chooses to execute an, an illegal war, it still has obligations under international law and it must comply with those obligations. We call again on the Russian Federation to end its war and to withdraw all forces unconditionally from the entirety of the sovereign territory of Ukraine. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of Ireland for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank Under Secretary General, Madam Rosemary De Carlo for her briefing as well as His Excellency President Zelensky for his address. Kenya stands in solidarity with the people of Ukraine who are suffering the failure of the multilateral system to bring an end to a war that continues unabated in disregard of the raison d'etre of the United Nations to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, a war whose catastrophic impact in Ukraine and across the world is worsening by the day. We are gravely concerned by the latest developments, especially in Mikolaev, Yoniv, Zotoma, Lviv, Odessa, and Chakasi regions, as well as in Kyiv, Kharkiv and Kremenchuk cities. The reported intensified airstrikes and missile shelling in these regions and cities are destroying civilian objects with a growing toll on civilian casualties. These indiscriminate acts constitute a violation of the UN Charter, international law, and international humanitarian law. Kenya condemns the disproportionate use of force and the targeting of civilians and objects indispensable to the survival of civilian populations, including residential homes, health facilities, shelters, shopping malls, as well as power and water infrastructure. We are concerned that the continued destruction of civilian infrastructure is significantly impeding Ukraine's ability to engage in international trade, including the export of key commodities, particularly agricultural products and farm inputs, such as fertilizer. In addition, the blockade of Ukraine's access to the Black Sea has disrupted the global food supply chain, and this is worsening food insecurity, especially in conflict situations and fragile economies in the global south. With the surging inflation rates and the spike in food and fuel prices globally, this armed conflict is undermining efforts to build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. We commend the Secretary General for his efforts, including the establishment of the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy, and Finance. This is a good 
first step towards the establishment of instruments that can cushion the most vulnerable from the effects of the conflict. Of critical importance, Mr. President, is the imperative to immediately stop further infliction of suffering on civilians, especially the vulnerable groups, including women, children, and the elderly. We therefore urge the parties to adhere to international humanitarian law, including the four 1949 Geneva Conventions and its first additional protocol of 1977, as well as ensure the protection of civilian population and detainees. We call on them to shift their focus to an immediate cessation of the war, refrain from any actions that may further escalate the situation, and prioritize the use of diplomatic tools to resolve the conflict. The cessation should set the foundation for a lasting peace settlement that respects the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine. It should also lead to the design of a European security order that offers lasting security and not a generation of new wars in Europe or elsewhere. Finally, I reaffirm Kenya's respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, let me thank USG Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing to the Council on the Prevailing Situation in Ukraine and the Rising Humanitarian Suffering Occasioned by the War. I also acknowledge the virtual participation of the President of Ukraine, His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky. My delegation reaffirms its unwavering support for the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Ghana is gravely concerned by the reports of the intensification of military bombardments in several regions across Ukraine over the past couple of days, and for which the ordinary people, especially women and children, are having to pay the highest price. We remain concerned that residential areas continue to be the target of missile launches and bombardments, and regret that such places have increasingly become the arena for combat. In this context, we call for an independent, impartial, and transparent investigation into the Kremonchuk Mall attack, which occurred yesterday and resulted in several casualties. Over the last four months, the war has continued unabated under conditions that have precipitated considerable human suffering and despair. While the present situation cast a grim outlook for peace, as purveyors of global peace and security, we cannot and must not lose hope of finding peace in the interest of the conflicting parties and the wider international community. With each passing day, the urgency to find a peaceful and durable solution to the conflict grows. The snowballing effect of the collateral economic impact on the rest of the international community, especially developing countries, which already are burdened by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and other pressing global challenges, could soon go beyond the reach of easy resolution. It is therefore our plea that ongoing diplomatic efforts should be given an opportunity for the cause of peace and the abatement of this needless war on the basis of a commitment to genuine and unconditional dialogue. We welcome the positive results that follow the Secretary General's visit to Kyiv and Moscow during the month of April, which demonstrate for us the utility of the United Nations in such delicate circumstances. We encourage the parties to accept the good offices of the Secretary General in repairing the broken trust occasioned by the war against Ukraine in order to move forward stored negotiations. We call for an immediate cessation of military engagements in areas populated by civilians and urge the urgent creation of demilitarized humanitarian corridors in all besieged areas in compliance with the precepts of international law and international humanitarian law. We note the obligation of the conflicting parties to proactively protect civilians and civilian infrastructure from harm. Similarly, aid and humanitarian workers must be afforded equal treatment of protection. 
In concluding, we urge maximum restraint and encourage rhetoric that is facilitative of a peaceful process. Finally, we re reiterate our call to the members of this council to harness all efforts in bringing an end to this war and restoring peace and stability to Ukraine. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Mexico. <clears throat> Gracias. Thank you, President. I thank Under Secretary General Di Carlo for her briefing, and President Zelensky, who has spoken to this Council once again today. The 24th of June marked four months since the beginning of this war. Unfortunately, once again, there has been an increase in attacks against civilian infrastructure and very populated areas in various regions of Ukraine, including Kyiv and particularly in Luhansk and Donetsk. We condemn yesterday's attack on a shopping centre in Kremenchuk, a shopping centre with many civilians inside it. We do not know the final number of deaths yet, but there are at least 18 deaths and dozens of injured, which is deplorable. An attack of this kind runs counter to international law and international humanitarian law. We support the call of the Humanitarian Coordinator for Ukraine for a prompt invest independent investigation to begin into these facts. Likewise, we reiterate our support for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in investigating possible war crimes committed in Ukraine. Equally unjustifiable are the bombardments of residential areas in numerous places in the Donbass, which have destroyed critical communications, infrastructure and services. These have seriously affected the provision of essential health services and access to various cities of the region. We call urgently for safe, unhindered access to be provided to all humanitarian personnel. One of the main precepts of international humanitarian law is the principle of distinction. And one of its ultimate objectives is to avoid, whenever possible, civilian suffering. And to reduce damage to a minimum. Failing to respect this principle is a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. The same pl applies to the use of cluster munitions. These are weapons which are prohibited by international humanitarian law. President, the proliferation of weapons is particularly worrisome in the region. This is a cause of additional volatility since their increased availability to civilians makes continued conflict increasingly likely. Excellencies, we must agree that mediation and dialogue resulting in a full ceasefire are a matter of urgency. This and this alone must be the priority of this Council. But until this happens, it is a priority to increase the humanitarian pauses which guarantee safe voluntary evacuation of the population and to find mechanisms to mobilize um, grain, fertilizer and other commodities which are blocked by the war in Ukraine and which are worsening the precarious situations of food insufficiency in many other regions of the world. Bringing an end to the war is a matter of urgency. Thank you, President. Thank the representative of Mexico for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. 
Спасибо, господин Thank you, Mr. President. Before I begin my statement, I would like to say the following. We are greatly concerned by the line taken by the Albanian presidency regarding the participation of President Zelensky in today's meeting. No consultations were held with all the members of the Council on this matter. Delegations were essentially presented with a fait accompli at the last possible moment. This violates existing practice and the traditions of the work of the Security Council. President Zelensky was already provided with an opportunity to address the Council once as a matter of exception and as the then British presidency assured without creating a presidency. A precedent, precedent. We do not see any basis to keep propagating such exceptions. We have all together repeatedly reaffirmed the understanding that representatives of states who wish to speak in the Council must be physically present in the chamber. The UN Security Council should not be turned into a platform for a remote PR campaign from President Zelensky in order to get more weapons from participants of the NATO summit. This undermines the authority of the Council as a body responsible for collective decisions on the maintenance of international peace and security. The Ukrainian party, at the instigation of our Western colleagues, is attempting to undermine this authority and turn the members of the Council into an audience for acting performances. I wish to draw attention to the fact that just a week ago, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Central African Republic was refused the opportunity to speak to the Council. The Council should not demonstrate double standards in order to serve the Ukrainian party and its Western backers, discriminating against African states while they do so. There should not be any exceptions for anyone. Mr. President, from the very beginning of the special military operation in Ukraine, which was aimed at ending the eight-year war of the Kiev regime against the civilian population of eastern Ukraine, we were faced with the fact that the true situation on the front line was not the main concern of Ukrainian authorities. They were much more concerned about another front, the information front, which they, together with their Western PR uh, propagandist collaborators, took up with special zeal. If someone were to try counting all the Ukrainian fakes that have been disseminated thus far, there would easily be enough for a weighty tome or even a collected body of works. Just take the beautiful but absolutely false legend about the Russian ship to which the brave defenders of Snake Island allegedly refused to surrender and for which they paid with their lives. They were awarded the title of Heroes of Ukraine posthumously for this by President Zelensky. Of course, it later turned out that the entire Ukrainian garrison of the island was alive and well and had safely surrendered to the Russian army. But the legend was not rewritten, and Ukraine still proudly issues stamps with this patriotic story. How about the famous ace pilot, the Phantom of Kiev, who allegedly terrorized the Russian Air Force and shot down dozens of Russian aircraft? No matter that his air exploits were illustrated with fragments from computer games or old internet videos. Later on, however, even Western journalists reluctantly had to admit that this was a fabrication. Yet some Ukrainian propagandists continue to exploit this legend to this day. Internet videos are a separate issue altogether. At the initial stages of the special military operations, even the British BBC was horrified by the number of Ukrainian video fakes. But then, like other Western media, it became to take a more relaxed approach and even to publish its own, passing off homes in Donetsk destroyed by Ukrainian shelling for buildings in Kiev. Ukrainians and their Western handlers quickly understood that whatever was happening on the ground was not important at all in our digital age. What was important was what the Western media was showing. 
taking advantage of the voluntary withdrawal of Russian troops from the Kiev and Chernihiv regions. Kiev and Western propagandists brought the world the provocation in Bucha, which was monstrous in its scale and equally monstrous in execution. Despite the glaring inconsistencies, many in the West still continue to believe in it, as we heard today. And the Kiev authorities used the place where it was carried out as a mandatory stopping point on the itinerary for foreign guests, since it is located close to Kiev. It's a kind of ominous marketing, which is very convenient for squeezing more armed supplies from sponsors. Bucha became a turning point in the supply of Western weapons, which was precisely the goal of the Ukrainian authorities. They themselves openly admitted this. As Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba said in an interview to the BBC on April 4th, and I quote, the massacre in Bucha should eliminate any hesitation and unwillingness on the part of the West to provide Ukraine with all necessary weapons, end of quote. Having gotten a taste, the key of successors of the White Helmets then tried to implement something no less ambitious. And that's when the shelling of the station in Kramatorsk came. It was meant to cement the global community's belief in the atrocities of the Russian army, but... This was done so clumsily and so unconvincingly that they now prefer not to recall it at all because the involvement of the armed forces of Ukraine in this crime is so obvious. And then, in the best tradition of Goebbels, the image of the barbaric Russian soldier, rapist, and marauder began to be implanted into Western minds exactly the same way that the Nazis did during the final stage of the Second World War. And at that point, our soldiers, according to Ukrainian propagandists and their tales, began to loot, rape, and sow fear with their unprecedented cruelty. We all remember how the representative of the Kiev regime sitting with us today told us with a, talked with a straight face about how our soldiers steal washing machines and even toilets because they've never had such miraculous appliances back home. Today, his followers have adapted and modified this ridiculous tale to the point where our soldiers now allegedly loot electric kettles but forget to take the basis for them because they don't know how to use them. Something that falls into this logic is the lies about the theft of Ukrainian grain, which we also heard today. And many in the West believed in all this. They pitied the poor Ukrainians and fiercely hated the Russians. And yet they were not in a hurry to check the facts while they regularly supplied Kiev with coveted weapons. But at a certain point, everything started to go wrong for the Ukrainian propagandists. Reports accusing Ukrainian soldiers and nationalists of cruelty and war crimes began to multiply on social media. Reports of looting, torture, rape, deliberate shelling of residential areas placing heavy weapons in those areas and using civilians as human shields. And there were not just dozens of such testimonies, but hundreds and thousands spreading across social networks. That is how, for instance, the legends about the shelling of the maternity hospital and the drama theater in Mariupol fell apart. And then more than two and a half thousand nationalists from the Azov Battalion, who had already been turned into martyrs and heroes, not only had to outright surrender, but also had to release hundreds of civilian hostages who told the truth about what had been done to them. Moreover, Ukrainian Ombudsman Denisova also let everyone down, going too far in recounting and relishing the details of rapes allegedly committed by Russian soldiers, descriptions of which our Western colleagues then willingly used, including in this chamber. After being fired, she was forced to admit that she deliberately lied so that Ukraine would continue to receive weapons. And it turned out that there was no evidence apart from Denifaza's lies, no, no evidence at all on the, that the Ukrainian and Western countries would have. Added to all this is video and evidence from the liberated and fiercely shelled cities of Donbass, as well as from liberated cities where people openly said that if there was anyone that they do fear and blame 
for what is going on. It is only the Ukrainian army and Western countries which gave it long-range weapons, allowing it to strike where Ukrainian artillery previously could not reach. Moreover, there were also the military failures caused by the inept actions and the betrayal of Ukrainian command, leaving barely armed soldiers, including new recruits, to their fate and not allowing them to surrender and save their lives since they were prevented from doing this or retreating this by detachments of nationalists who shoot their own in the back. There have been too many similar videos from the Ukrainian military lately, and they are surrendering by the hundreds, if not the thousands. It became increasingly difficult to conceal all this from the Ukrainian and global public Thousands of soldiers ended up in the new pocket uh, in the Severodonetsk and Lysansk area. And this on the eve of the NATO summit where the issue of new arms supplies to Ukraine would be discussed. Arms that can not only be used but sold to third parties following the schemes uh, familiar to Ukrainian officials attributing everything to military losses. In other words, it became obvious that in order to return the attention of the world community back to Ukraine, even though it was becoming fatigued, a new Bucha-style provocation was necessary. But the problem was that the Russian army had not retreated from anywhere for a long time, and planting corpses or shooting civilians only made sense only on territories that had been brought back under Kiev's control. That is when, apparently, the idea came to stage a new type of provocation, an alleged strike on a shopping center in Kremlin Troop. In reality, there was no strike on the shopping center. The Russian armed forces used precision weapons to strike hangars with Western weapons and ammunition received from the United States and European countries in the area of the Kremlin Troop road machinery plant. Those weapons and ammunition were spread throughout the warehouse area for further shipment to Ukrainian troops in Donbass. In other words, in order to use those weapons to shell residential areas of Donetsk, Luhansk, and other cities. The strikes of the Russian armed forces allowed to prevent this. The long-range artillery supplied by the West gives the armed forces of Ukraine the opportunity, the ability to reach remote rear areas of Donbass and to strike them without any military purpose whatsoever, but only to intimidate civilians. On June 5th, the strikes were carried out by the armed forces of Ukraine using 155 millimeters Caesar howitzers received from NATO countries, as a result of which six civilians died and more than 30 were injured. Every week, dozens more dead and injured are added to these horrific statistics. Yesterday, the Ukrainian armed forces used the M142 HIMARS multiple locket rot uh, system for the first time in Pervalsk in the Luhansk People's Republic. Mentions of such strikes against civilians and civilian targets in Donbass were not heard once today from our Western colleagues. You simply don't care about this, just as you prefer to ignore the Kiev's methodical extermination of the people of Donetsk and Luhansk for eight years as it was going on. Now returning to Kremenchuk, the Amstor shopping center was located some distance away and it was not hit. This can be seen on video from surveillance cameras. Um, if a missile were to hit the shopping center, nothing would have been left of it. The video posted by Ukrainian bloggers, however, shows that goods located in sho inside the shopping center were not affected by the blast. They were still standing on their shelves and had not even fallen down. The houses adjacent to the shopping center were not damaged either. The glass in the windows was still intact. This would have only been possible if the ro rocket had exploded at a considerable distance away. However, the detonation of ammunition for Western weapons that was stored in the warehouse created a fire which then spread to the shopping center. Our dear Western colleagues, I have gone into the details of the work of Ukrainian propaganda so much here today in the hopes that you will finally understand just how ridiculous and how unconvincing you look 
as you pick up and promote new products of Ukrainian agate prop propaganda. These include not only the fakes and the stage incidents I mentioned, but also claims that Russia is allegedly preventing exports of Ukrainian grain. Kiev only wants support in the form of money and weapons from you. But you must understand that shipments of the latter, as we warned you from the very beginning, were and remain military targets for us, just like mercenaries from your states. And the facilities where these weapons and mercenaries are located or stockpiled also become legitimate military targets, as were the hangars on the territory of the Kremenchuk road machinery plant. The regime in Kiev is deliberately storing weapons in the very center of cities next to residential areas, endangering the population and turning it into a human shield. And you try not to notice this devaluing the very values that you allegedly attempt to promote. At the same time, no matter how much we may try to deny the facts and claim otherwise, we have not carried out any strikes against civilian peaceful targets, nor have we ever done so. If you do not believe us, you can turn to eyewitness accounts and listen to the assessments of military experts. They will confirm, for example, that the residential being, building in Kiev, which was mentioned today, was not damaged by a Russian cruise missile, but as a result of the poor work of two Ukrainian air defense systems that shot down their own anti-aircraft missiles over the building. Your unwillingness to acknowledge this doesn't change the truth. In conclusion, I would like to once again emphasize that by supplying weapons, you only prolong the agony of the criminal Kiev regime, which is prepared to sacrifice its own population. And the sooner you realize this, the sooner Ukrainian leadership will sit down at the negotiating table with a realistic position rather than with slogans and phantom pains. We began the special military operation in order to this to stop the shelling of Donbass by Ukraine and so that the territory of this country, which has turned, been turned into anti-Russia at the behest of a number of Western countries, as well as its nationalist leadership, ceases to pose a threat to Russia or the inhabitants of the south and southeast of Ukraine. And until those goals are achieved, our operation will continue. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking uh, Under Secretary General Rosemary DiCarlo for briefing on the situation in Ukraine. We acknowledge the participation and remarks of uh, President of Ukraine in today's briefing. India remains deeply concerned over the situation in Ukraine. The conflict has resulted in loss of lives and countless miseries for its peoples, particularly for women, children, and elderly, with millions becoming homeless and forced to take shelter in neighboring countries. From the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, India has been consistently calling for complete cessation of hostilities and advocated the path of peace, dialogue, and diplomacy. We support all efforts to alleviate the suffering of the people of Ukraine, especially talks between Ukraine and the Russian Federation. India has also se has been sending uh, humanitarian supplies to Ukraine and its neighbors, which include medicines and other essential relief material. Reports of deaths of civilians in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict are deeply disturbing, and in this regard, we express our grave concern. In recent years, critical civilian infrastructure in urban areas have become easy targets in situations of armed conflict. The issue of the protection of civilian objects in armed conflict should be considered within the framework of applicable international law. Earlier, India had unequivocally condemned the killings of civilians in Busha and supported the call for an independent investigation. Mr. President, the impact of the Ukraine conflict is not just limited to Europe. The conflict is exacerbating concerns over food, fertilizer, fuel security, particularly in the developing countries. It is necessary for all of us to adequately appreciate the importance of equity affordability and accessibility when it comes to food grains. 
Open markets must not become an argument to perpetuate inequity and promote discrimination. India is committed to work constructively in mitigating the adverse impact of the conflict on food security. We have welcomed the recommendation of the Global Crisis Response Group Task Team to exempt purchases of food by WFP for humanitarian assistance from food export restrictions. India has been providing financial assistance as well as supplying food grains to countries which are impacted by the Ukraine conflict. India has exported 1.8 million tons of wheat to countries in need, including to Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan, and Yemen in the last two months. We are also helping our neighbor Sri Lanka to ensure their food security. We are trying to increase the production of fertilizers in India. There is also a need to focus on the availability of fertilizers and keep the supply chains of fertilizers smooth at a global scale. Similarly, efforts should be made to ensure stability in the global supply of fuel commensurate with the demand. We reiterate that the importance of uh, UN guiding principles of humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian action must always be guided by the principles of humanitarian assistance, that is humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. These measures should never be politicized. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by reaffirming that the contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, international law, and respect for sovereignty and the territorial integrity of the states. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of China. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the military conflict in Ukraine is already over four months this long. On this geopolitical crisis of great concern to the international community, China has always made its independent assessments based on the historical context and the merits of the Ukrainian issue. Chinese leaders repeatedly noted the necessity to respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries to adhere to the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter, to heed the legitimate security concerns of all countries, and to support all those efforts that are conducive to the peaceful settlement of the crisis. For some time now, China has joined all peace-loving countries in calling for a ceasefire. We have been keenly committed to promoting peace talks and made unremitting efforts for de-escalating the situation, early restoration of peace, and mitigating humanitarian situation and stabilizing the global economic order. It is regrettable and worrying that the conflict continues. The crisis is trending in a protracted and expanded direction. Humanitarian situation remains dire. Civilian casualties are growing, and people are suffering. Multifaceted spillover effects are exacerbating global challenges. We stress again that dialogue and negotiation is the only viable way to restore and consolidate peace, and ending hostility soon is a keen aspiration of the international community. China supports direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. We also welcome Secretary General's good offices on the issue of uh, grain export, among others. Mr. President, peace is for all to strive for and to defend. All members of the international community should responsibly work for a proper resolution of the crisis and avoid uh, contrary actions. All parties should work in concert to create the necessary environment and conditions for peace talks by the parties. Facts have fully borne out that sending weapons cannot bring about peace, nor can sanctions and pressurization solve the security conundrum. Attempts to weaponize the world economy and to coerce other countries into taking sides 
will artificially divide the international community and make the world even less secure. Delaying and obstructing diplomatic negotiations for geopolitical purposes or even adding fuel to the fire to intensify confrontation will only magnify the conflict and inevitably end up in hurting oneself. Mr. President, this Ukrainian crisis has once again sounded alarm for the world. Security is indivisible. A blind faith in a position of strength and expansion of military alliances and a pursuit of one's own security at the expense of other countries' security will inevitably lead to security dilemmas. NATO's five eastward expansions after the Cold War have not only failed to make Europe secure, but also sown the seeds of conflict. It is a lesson that is worth some good reflecting upon. The Cold War ended a long time ago. It is necessary for NATO to reconsider its own positioning and its responsibilities. Completely abandon the Cold War mentality that is based on block confrontation and strive to build a balanced, effective, and sustainable European security framework in line with the principle of indivisible security. Like all peace-loving countries and peoples in the world, China pays close attention to NATO's strategic adjustment and is deeply concerned about uh, the policy implication of the so-called strategic concept. Certain NATO leaders lately painted other countries as a threat. But the fact is, it is NATO itself that has made troubles in different parts of the world. We urge NATO to learn its lessons and not to use this crisis in Ukraine as an excuse to stoke worldwide block confrontation or a new Cold War, and not to look for imaginary enemies in Asia-Pacific or artificially create contradictions and divisions. We firmly oppose certain elements clamoring for NATO's involvement in Asia-Pacific or an Asia-Pacific version of NATO on the back of military alliances. The long outdated Cold War script must never be reenacted in Asia-Pacific. The kind of turmoil and conflict that is affecting parts of the world must not be allowed to happen in Asia-Pacific. Asia-Pacific countries share an appreciation for the hard-won peace and prosperity, and a wish to focus on mutually beneficial cooperation in pursuit of common development and revitalization. Any attempt to go against the tide of history is doomed to fail. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Mr. President, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo for her detailed briefing. We acknowledge President Zelensky's address to the Council and his first-hand account of the latest developments in Ukraine. We meet today following concerning reports of intensified missile strikes across Ukraine in urban areas, including Kiev and Kharkiv. In particular, the images in Kremenchuk of a shopping mall, something familiar to all of us in our everyday life, engulfed in flames are horrifying. This incident has added to the war's immensely high human toll and should be properly investigated. Incidents like these are a clear demonstration of why civilian objects are protected under international law. The UAE reiterates its unequivocal condemnation of attacks on civilians and civilian objects and infrastructure. With the conflict now entering its fifth month, women and children and the elderly are disproportionately impacted. More than half of Ukraine's children are now displaced from home, and women, children, and the elderly are suffering from ongoing violence and trauma and seeking refuge in neighboring countries. It is well past time that we find parameters for ceasefire negotiations as a starting point to end this war. If the conflict continues unabated, we can expect the tsunami of global ramifications to worsen. 
people around the world are already suffering, both directly and from the conflict's wider repercussions, including distorted global trade, the effects of sanctions, and increased food prices, threatening a global recession. The most vulnerable, as always, are the worst affected. In this context, I would like to make the following points. First, the application of international humanitarian law is fundamental to preserving human life. Compliance is both a moral and a legal obligation, and we reiterate the importance of respecting the principles of necessity, distinction, and proportionality that are paramount in conflict, as well as the importance of ensuring accountability. Any military operation must be limited to exclusively military objectives, and all precautionary measures must be taken to avoid the direct or indirect targeting of civilians. The fact that the war in Ukraine has so greatly affected heavily urbanized areas with high-density civilian populations only underlines the imperative of applying the principles outlined in the Council's framework on the protection of civilians and civilian objects. Second, the international community should intensify efforts to de-escalate and engage proactively to end this conflict. Almost two months have passed since this Council adopted a presidential statement expressing deep concern regarding the maintenance of international peace and security in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine, however, has continued to escalate. The UN Charter outlines many of the tools that can be deployed to reach a peaceful settlement, but knowing that the tools exist or that they are at the disposal of the parties is not enough. The talk needs to be walked, and now is the time to have an actual dialogue on the humanitarian challenges and to prioritize an immediate cessation of hostilities, laying out the contours of a sustainable solution that ends this conflict and ends it on a foundation upon which peace can be built. We encourage the parties to seize this opportunity, and we urge the Secretary General and others in trying to bring together the parties for good faith negotiations to this end. Third, helping ease global food insecurity must be a priority. This cannot wait we must avoid a food catastrophe. We are already facing what David Beasley so vividly described as having to take food from the hungry to feed the starving. Specifically, there needs to be a solution to export the grain and fertilizer that are so critical to food systems around the world. We are encouraged by ongoing efforts aimed at allowing ships safe passage to and from key seaports, including Odessa. The Security Council must do everything within its power to support these negotiations and we look forward to the Council addressing this in more detail. Finally, Mr. President, the devastation in Ukraine from this war is undeniable. We risk a lost generation of children denied education and opportunity. We need to redouble our efforts to achieve peace and end this human suffering. This Council must exhaust all avenues and spare no efforts to this objective. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the UAE for their statement and I give the floor to Representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Under Secretary General Mr. Romani De Carlo for her briefing. I welcome the virtual participation of President Zelensky in this meeting. Mr. President, the war in Ukraine has now been going on for more than four months and its consequences continue to spread on the humanitarian and security level as the political and diplomatic horizon appears to be receding and shrinking to nothing. The serious humanitarian crisis resulting from the war must absolutely be stemmed. Too many civilians have paid with their lives and millions of them, many women and children, have been forced to flee combat areas to seek refuge in other cities in the country or abroad. Despite the outpouring of international solidarity to host Ukrainian refugees, and despite the commitment of the UN and its specialized agencies to assist them, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine is worsening with the bombardments, the destruction of production and distribution facilities, and the disruption of value chains. Outside Ukraine, the consequences of the war are exacerbating food insecurity in countries already in conflict. In some regions, the specter of famine looms as a likely prospect as aid workers struggle to provide urgently needed food aid. 
At the same time, many countries are facing unprecedented economic inflation, which is straining their economies. This gloomy picture is, however, not inevitable. It is urgent for this crisis to be brought under control and for its upper effects to be rapidly contained. There is still time to avoid chaos. The parties to the conflict must find a consensus regarding the export of the tons of wheat that are being held up in Ukrainian ports. In this regard, we welcome the actions taken by the African Union, and we hope that they will soon yield results within a reasonable time frame. Many farmers, especially in Africa, are waiting for fertilizers for their crops. For those of them who are already facing significant climate challenges, this situation creates uncertainty that could threaten agricultural production. Mr. President, we are concerned about the signals we are seeing which suggest a clear desire to prolong the war. We repeat, the world does not need another protracted conflict. That said, the, the war is not a state of lawlessness. The parties to the conflict must respect their commitments under international humanitarian law, refrain from any use of weapons of mass destruction, and do everything possible to facilitate unimpeded and secure access for humanitarian aid. Civilians and civilian infrastructure must not be targeted. We condemn the artillery fire targeting a shopping center in central Ukraine yesterday. The tendency to trivialize the threat of the use of weapons of mass destruction is a matter of concern for my country. As a party to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the Biological Weapons Convection, we condemn any use or threat of use of weapons with indiscriminate effects. The very existence of such weapons poses a real threat to our shared peace and security. Mr. President, my country continues to believe that the best way to end the humanitarian crisis and the outbreak of violence in Ukraine is to end the conflict. We remain convinced that the international community has the means to bring the parties to the discussion table. We urge the parties to engage in good faith, in constructive dis uh, negotiations, to leverage all diplomatic and political challenge channels in order to find a negotiated and consensual solution to the conflict. Peace and security must remain the ultimate objective towards which the initiatives of all the parties and of the international community converge. We call for the cessation of hostilities with a view to returning to peaceful coexistence. Thank you. I thank the representative of Gabon for her statement. Lord, the representative of Norway. Thank you, President. I thank you, USG Di Carlo, for shedding further light on the situation in Ukraine and the continued attacks against civilians by Russian forces. I welcome also the strong testimony of President Zelensky on behalf of the people of Ukraine. First, <clears throat> Norway reiterates that Russia's war is, in and of itself, a violation of international law. The principles of the UN Charter are clear on the illegality of the acquisition of territory by force. We reiterate our call for Russia to stop its illegal attack on Ukraine immediately. Second, Norway strongly condemns all violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. We condemn in the strongest term the reported killings of Ukrainian civilians, and we call on Russia to immediately end these indiscriminate and deliberate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. The targeting of residential areas, such as the devastating missile attack against a shopping center in Kremachuk yesterday, is unacceptable. The urban warfare and intensified Russian missile attacks against Kyiv, Kharkiv, and other cities is causing immense civilian suffering. We reiterate our demand and the demand of international law 
that the civilian population must be protected and that all necessary measures be taken to avoid civilian casualties. International humanitarian law must be fully respected and implemented. We condemn Belarus for facilitating Russia's attack on Ukraine. Third, violation of international law cannot go unchallenged. All violations need to be investigated and perpetrators of any crimes must be brought to justice. We support the investigation by the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine and other international investigations. President, as the war in Ukraine continues, it is inflicting a terrible cumulative harm on the civilian population, undermining prospects for peace and security. The protection of civilians and human rights is a prerequisite for sustainable peace after conflict. In Ukraine, the best way to protect civilians is clear. It is for Russia to end this war. Thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for their statement. The representative of the United Kingdom has asked for the floor to make a further statement, and I give them the floor. Thank you, President. Uh, I don't want to take too much more time, but I wanted to say that the Russian representative can try to claim that nothing is true and make outrageous claims of Ukrainian provocations. Cover-ups are as old as crime itself. But the undeniable fact is that Russian forces are in Ukraine and there are no Ukrainian forces in Russia. There is one aggressor here. The evidence will catch up with them and there will be accountability for these crimes. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom uh, for their statement. The representative of the Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give them the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I will also be brief. I won't take too much of your time. I just wanted to note that such statements sound very convincing coming from a representative of a country that brought the world such provocations as the Skripal case or the Litvinenko case, as well as many other incidents that will go down in the history books as glaring provocations and false flag operations. Please keep that in mind next time you try to teach us lessons. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for this further statement, and I give the floor now to representative of Estonia. Mr. President, I speak on behalf of the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and my own country, Estonia. I thank the Albanian presidency for organizing uh, this briefing and Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for the updates on Russia's full-scale barbaric military aggression against an independent and sovereign country that wishes nothing more than living in peace and freedom to choose their own destiny, free from foreign interference in its internal affairs. We warmly welcome President Zelensky's participation in this meeting and commend him and the Ukrainian people for their heroic courage and resistance for the freedom of their country and for the freedom of us all. Crime against aggression is a prime crime against the international law. Putin's regime has unleashed a colonial, neo-imperialist, expansionist war against Ukraine, amplified by the obscene, dehumanizing disinformation campaign against Ukraine and the identity, language, history, and the right to exist of Ukrainian people. The Security Council must urgently perform its duties to stop this unfolding catastrophe. As we have seen over the course of four months, 124 days now, unable to defeat the defenders of Ukraine in the battlefield, Russia's military seeks to achieve its aims by terrorizing civilians. We have already seen this too many times, 
maternity hospitals, schools, kindergartens, residential buildings, and now also shopping centers are targeted indiscriminately and without any remorse. Russia's terror knows no bounds. The shelling of a crowded shopping center in Kremenchuk, as well as numerous other intensi intensified attacks on Ukrainian cities, Stolviansk, Kharkiv, Kiev, in recent days had no military justification whatsoever. No justification other than to kill, injure, and cause extensive human suffering, and thereby hope that the spirit of Ukrainian people will be broken, the calls for peace at all costs will grow, and that the demands of the aggressor will subsequently be met. This is the diplomacy Russian way, by using terror and blackmail. The Russian actions represent flagrant violations of international law, including the United Nations Charter. Russia has repeatedly ignored the calls by the UN General Assembly, as well as the, other, as well as the order of the International Court of Justice to immediately suspend the military operations in its territory of Ukraine and with, withdraw its armed forces from Ukraine. The borders of a country are not to be changed by force. This demand is the heart and soul of the UN Charter. The systemic violations of humanitarian law and human rights, deliberate attacks on civilian objects and civilians, executions, sexual and gender-based violence, arbitrary arrests, abductions, enforced disappearances, and forced deportations of civilians, including unaccompanied children to Russia, as well as their illegal adoption committed against Ukrainian people, amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity, and possibly even genocide. The international community should not spare any effort to ensure that those responsible for these atrocious crimes are held to account. We need collectively to give our strongest support to the ongoing work by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the Independent International Commission of Inquiry, mandated by the United Nations Human Rights Council, and the work of the expert mission under the Mo Moscow mechanism of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as the national investigation by the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine. Justice will be brought to the victims and their families. Mr. President, we are concerned that yet again has Russia resorted to dangerous and irresponsible nuclear rhetoric by announcing its intention to transfer nuclear capable missiles to Belarus and upgrading Belarus warplanes to make them capable of carrying nuclear weapons. We urge Russia and Belarus to act in line with their international commitments and cease destabilizing nuclear subrattling. Any use of weapons of mass destruction is unacceptable and leads to severe consequences. We her herewith strongly condemn the involvement of Belarus as Russia's complicity in this aggression against Ukraine. We also strongly condemn Russia's weaponizing food to increase food shortage and global hunger and thus destabilize international security. Recent reports have shown that Russian forces have been systemic systematically stealing grain and other products from local farmers in occupied areas of Ukraine. As a result of Russia's military activity, more than 20 million tons of grain is currently blocked in Ukraine. We fully support the efforts of the United Nations to find an urgently needed solution for the export of Ukraine's grain and urge Russia to ensure free passage of shipping from Ukrainian ports. Mr. President, let me reiterate that it is the obligation of each member of the international community to stand up against those who violate the principles and rules of international law, including the UN Charter. Otherwise, we risk losing the international rules-based order we built and committed to since the end of the World War II. Fundamental principles of respecting sovereignty, territorial integrity, and refraining from the use of force are to be respected by every country and are not for debate. We resolutely condemn Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. We urge once again Russia to immediately stop its indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure 
and to immediately and unconditionally withdraw all its troops and military equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania stand with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thank you. I thank the representative of Estonia for their statement and I give the floor to the representative of Poland. Mr. President, thank you for convening this important meeting. I also take this opportunity to thank USG Di Carlo for her briefing as well as His Excellency President Zelensky for his powerful statement. Mr. President, irrespectively of what we have heard again from the Russian representative today, Russia is waging a total war against Ukraine. A total war which from its very beginning, 124 days ago, has been in total lack of respect for the international humanitarian law and human rights law. We have a duty to repeat it over and over again, even though the aggressors themselves keep reminding us about the true character of their actions with every atrocity they commit. Yesterday's deadly rocket attack launched by Russian forces on a bustling shopping center in Kremenchuk was just the latest in the long list of those somber reminders. As the heart-wrenching images are still before our eyes, we need to be loud and clear. In only the past four days, Russia has fired over 130 missiles on Ukrainian cities of Kiev, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, and Odessa, to name just a few. By deciding to hit objects of no military significance, Moscow wants to cause large human losses, terrorize the civilian population, and disrupt the functioning of infrastructure catering to everyday needs of ordinary Ukrainians. According to cautious estimates provided by the OHCHR, only between June 23rd and June 26th more than 120 civilian casualties were confirmed. The shelling of the Amster Mall in Kremenchuk alone killed at least 20 people and injured 60 more. Moscow is not only disregarding humanitarian issues and ignoring international criticism, it wants to show that it will strive to break the resistance of the Ukrainian authorities by all means and costs. Mr. President, with respect to the important topic we are discussing, Russia continues to disrespect this Council and the UN Charter. It is particularly cynical that Russia, a permanent member of the Security Council, which has been entrusted with the responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security, is not only failing to fulfill its basic responsibilities, but acts as an aggressor in blatant disregard for this organization and the foundational rules the international peace and security mechanisms have been built on. It is our duty to work together to collect and preserve the evidence of all violations of human rights and international humanitarian law that have taken place in Ukraine. Poland's position in this regard is clear. All those responsible, directly and indirectly, for committing war crimes in Ukraine should be brought to justice. Apart from seeking justice, Ukraine has a full right to defend itself and expect the international community to provide necessary assistance in this regard. Humanitarian, military and financial aid allows Ukrainians to protect their citizens, secure their basic needs and ensure post-war recovery. For 124 days now, Ukrainians have been bravely putting resistance to the aggressor's forces, which continue to strive for a territorial grab which might actually never satisfy their appetite for more. The responsibility for the Russian actions lies also with Belarus, which, since the 24th of February, has been actively facilitating Moscow's military action by making its airspace, territory, and infrastructure available to Russian troops. If not for Minsk's support, Russia's aggression would have been limited Belarusian leadership should be considered complicit of crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine. Mr. President, once more, we urge the Russian Federation to stop the war 
and to fully withdraw all its forces from the territory of Ukraine. This is the only way to prevent further deaths of civilians. We also urge Russia to fully respect the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine, as well as international humanitarian law and human rights law in particular. I thank you. I thank the representative of Poland for their statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. This meeting is adjourned.